And our guest is no stranger to us. <laughs> In fact, uh, Yanis Gregoriadis was the Cayman Visiting Professor uh, 2018 and 2019. Although he wasn't physically present there at that time either, he had to postpone his visit uh, a little bit. Um, and so, so I think you're already familiar with him, but let me just mention that he is uh, uh, an associate professor at uh, Bilkent University, and he's also the Jean Monnet Chair of uh, European Studies at the same place. And also quite recently, he has been acting as the director of the Turkish uh, Turkey uh, table or program, I suppose, at Eliomap. Uh, Eliomap is a very influential uh, foundation in Greece. Uh, it's the Hellenic Foundation for uh, European and Foreign Policy. So Yanis will be uh, in charge of the, the Turkey side of things. So in other words, Yanis is the most qualified person to speak about this issue right now. And he kindly agreed to join us again and uh, enlighten us, uh, give us some information about the crisis that I guess was not really a crisis in the end. So I guess I'm going to stop here and leave the floor to Yanis. Welcome. Uh, hello, and thank you very much for this invitation. It's always a pleasure to work with you and the Cayman program. And uh, although our experience, our working together has been affected by external uh, factors beyond our uh, capabilities to control and manage, I do look forward to uh, our future collaboration. And I was very happy to receive this invitation exactly because, as you said, the Eastern Mediterranean is an area that I've been following uh, through my studies in, in, in Turkey, also in my capacity as a Greek scholar working in Greek-Turkish relations. So we've witnessed that a conflict that has been dormant for years suddenly became uh, a very hot one and threatened to bring the whole region into an armed conflict. So. And my presentation today tries to highlight why. Why did it happen at this particular moment and why in that particular spot? So I will try to, in my presentation, identify four main reasons for the emergence of the Mediterranean as a conflict zone. Uh, and uh, as you see on my presentation, I'm arguing that first reason is energy, and we'll talk about energy in detail. The second reason is Cyprus, uh, and the lack of resolution in Cyprus, and to some degree, a spillover from the Cyprus problem to Greek-Turkish disputes in the region. The third reason, I argue, is Libya, and uh, Turkey's involvement in the civil war there and uh, the development of this very close partnership between the uh, Tripoli government and Turkey that uh, sort of polarized relations between uh, Egypt and Turkey to an unprecedented degree. Uh, and of course, uh, fourth is some uh, domestic developments in Turkey that led to the emergence of what is called in Turkish Mavri Vatan or Blue Homeland project from the margins of Turkish politics to the mainstream. So these ideas were already there for many years, but they were never officially endorsed. So in a nutshell, my presentation will go over these four very important points for my, uh, in my opinion that highlight why this conflict happened. In my conclusion, I will try to highlight uh, what can be done in order to avoid further escalation. Fortunately, since the time we discussed uh, uh, things are calmer now, but it is important to see that one of the most important problems in Greek-Turkish disputes or in other disputes is that leaders don't take the risks or don't take the opportunity to solve problems when they are dormant. Or... And then, of course, then an event happens and then the crisis emerges out of a dispute that could have been resolved when minds were calmer, but was not resolved because nobody wanted to take the extra step and sort of try to address the issue. So I will highlight this. The first reason, in my view, about this 
uh, conflict in the Eastern Mediterranean is the discovery of natural gas resources. Uh, in the previous decade, Israel first, Cyprus second, and Egypt third discovered some sizable natural gas reserves in the Eastern Mediterranean. So for the first time, there was a hope a, disc, a sort of an opportunity that this region would become an energy exporter. And suddenly the seabed of the Eastern Mediterranean appeared to be uh, more valuable. Of course, one needs to highlight here that uh, these expectations were, may have been a bit uh, too optimistic because the costs of extracting this natural gas is particularly high. This is, is this a very deep part of the Mediterranean. So it is technically possible to extract from the, and I can show you a map here where you can see where the Israel finds where and where the Aphrodite gas field, the Cyprus field is there, and the Egyptian Zohar, the biggest one, field is there. So extraction is expensive and assumes a very high or a sort of reasonably high energy prices in the market. So for companies to come and invest, because these projects cannot be realized by the countries involved, the countries cannot afford these projects or they don't have the, the technology for this project. So they need to bring companies, but companies need to make profits and they need to look into what they can make out of it. So in any case, 10 years ago, the market was more optimistic. So there was increased interest. So uh, the success of Cyprus in discovering natural gas in its southern exclusive economic zone, raised Turkey's interest. So, and raised Turkey's interest on two reasons. I think it's very important to highlight this when we talk about the conflict between, uh, let's say, Turkey and Cyprus on the question of natural gas exploitation. There is the first issue is that uh, the Republic of Cyprus since 1964 nominally as a bicommunal state, but in practice, it remains a state controlled by the Greek Cypriots. So this generates a sort of contradiction. And uh, while Turkey has failed to recognize the Republic of Cyprus since 1964, unlike the rest of the international community, it still claims the rights of Turkish Cypriots according to the founding treaty of 1960. So Turkey claimed when the, Cip the Republic of Cyprus government started uh, exploration operations or drilling operations, that Turkish Cypriots were not involved in decision-making process. So they highlight the interest of Turkish Cypriots. This is one argument. The second argument that Turkey uh, expressed in other uh, drillings, in other spots where the Republic of Cyprus were issuing licenses was that this is not the Cyprus exclusive economic zone, but Turkey's exclusive economic zone. So there was a dispute whether this, this part of the Eastern Mediterranean was Cypriot or Turkish. This comes closer to the dis dispute between Greece and Turkey about uh, whether this uh, part of the uh, Eastern Mediterranean is under Greek or Turkish jurisdiction. This dispute, of course, is based on Turkey's uh, refusal to accept the sort of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which was signed in 1982, but in principle gave islands uh, rights for con territorial water, con waters, continental shelf and exclusive economic zone. From Turkey's point of view, islands don't have equal rights as mainlands. So it claims that Cyprus doesn't have exclusive economic zone because it is an island. Of course, this is something that the international community generally not doesn't agree with. There are cases whereby disputes can be resolved by the international court on the application of a number of principles. So equity is one of such principles, and we'll look into this in detail later. But there have been this different uh, basis for confrontation when it came to the Cyprus issue. Of course, the ideal situation, here I'm having just some pictures showing how the, uh, the Republic of Cyprus tried to give uh, licenses to international companies to conduct exploration and drilling in different parts of the Cypriot exclusive economic zone. These operations 
stopped about two years ago when an Italian uh, vessel attempted to drill and Turkish vessels, military vessels, kind of harassed it. So any, the Turkish the Italian company, chose to give up exploration due to the presence of Turkish vessels. Of course, ever since the market situation has become so worse, so the energy prices have fallen, COVID has made things even worse. So right now, no company is in a position to invest the billions of dollars necessary to extract this natural gas. Nevertheless, this discussion remain very relevant for Turkish politics. Why? Because eventually it's, it's, it became less about energy and money and economic development and became more about strategic partnerships and sort of uh, alliances in the regional context. To some degree, Turkey's growing regional isolation was reflected in the emerging energy alliances in the Eastern Mediterranean. And what I mean by this, I'll show you this project, the so-called East Med Pipeline project. Assuming that there was no conflict uh, between Greece, Turkey, and Cyprus, and uh, Israeli-Turkey relations were normal and good, the most rational uh, way to transport the natural gas from the Eastern Mediterranean was through a pipeline to Turkey. This pipeline would be technically easier to make, it would be cheaper, and Turkey itself is a big natural gas consumer. So, and Turkey wants to diversify from Russia in terms of its energy import. So, assuming no conflict, this, this gas would be shipped to Turkey. But because there is conflict, and because Turkey is isolated, there has been this project which you see here. So a pipeline that was meant to connect uh, uh, Israel, Cyprus, and potentially Egyptian natural gas reserves with uh, the island, the Greek island of Crete and the Greek mainland. This pipeline would transport this East Mediterranean natural gas to the European markets bypassing Turkey. Of course, this pipeline is easier designed on a map than made on the on the ground. Why? Because you can see uh, how deep the sea is there. It is a very expensive and ultimately unrealistic project. So everybody discussing this knew that the economics of this did not make sense because it would be a super expensive project for a not and the, uh, and the natural gas would arrive in Europe in non-competitive prices. Nobody would like to buy this gas at this price. However, this project and all the politics around this, meetings between the Greek prime minister, the Cypriot president, the Israeli prime minister, or the Egyptian president, created some sort of encirclement fear in Turkey. That is a sort of an old sort of uh, uh, fear that uh, Republican Turkey has been uh, feeling regarding all explorations of Greece or Cyprus uh, in terms of extending their maritime zone. So the idea that Turkey will be strangled from the south and will not be able to have access to the seas has been a perennial concern well before Erdogan. So this is not an AKP policy really. This is a policy already from the 60s and 70s. And remember I said that Turkey objected to the Interna United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea because of this concern. So this project, although it was not really realistic, amplified this concern and uh, made the Turkish government feel that, you know, we're isolated and, you know, they're trying to corner us in Anatolia, but we will do something in order to break this. And what can they do to break this? Of course, is uh, take the opportunity of uh, the Libya civil war. So as you can see here on the map, Egypt is already a non-friendly country for Turkey. Israel has become another non-friendly country for Turkey. Let's forget about Syria the situation there and how Turkey is sort of involved in the civil war there and the presence of Turkish troops in the north of the country. Cyprus, Greece. So. Uh, the Libyan civil war gave Turkey the opportunity to find 
a strong ally, like a local ally that could to some degree break this Turkish isolation in the Eastern Mediterranean. As we know, and let me go to this uh, slide here. Uh, this slide here, uh, this is the slide of the, civil, of the Libyan civil war right now. Uh, you may have heard that right now there are two governments, there are two authorities, de facto authorities in Libya. The one in the West is the government of national accord, which is the internationally recognized government uh, by under Fayez al Sarraj, who is a close ally of Turkey. And uh, uh, they have strong uh, political and religious links because it is a government that is close to the Muslim Brotherhood. So it is close to the Libyan uh, branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. What you see in yellow is the part of Libya controlled by the Libyan National Army and the Parliament of Libya. Interestingly, the Parliament of Libya is based in Tobruk in the east part of the country. And uh, it is the last elected parliament of the country in the, in the elections that happened a couple of years ago. It hasn't been possible to have elections ever since. And uh, there are two figures there that are dominant. Akile Saleh, who is the president of the parliament, and Khalifa Haftar, who is the, the general of the Libyan National Army. So recently, the pro-Turkey government in Western Libya suffered an attack by Haftar, and there was concern about uh, even the fall of Tripoli and the collapse of the Western camp. At that moment, Turkey decided to intervene and sent significant military aid to the Libyan government. This was last November. And in that context, uh, Turkey had an agreement signed with uh, Libya, the Tripoli government that delineated the exclusive economic zone between Libya and Turkey. Here is the question, of course. Do Libya and Turkey have common exclusive economic zone borders? Well, if we assume that the Greek islands have zero exclusive economic zone borders, then guess. So this was the agreement that was signed back in November and really raised a huge alarm in Greek foreign policy. Why? Because was an agreement that identify what you see here, the line EF, as a border between the Turkey and the uh, Libyan exclusive economic zone and continental shelf. Let me explain. Uh, the two terms are normally used interchangeably. Let me explain the difference. Continental shelf refers only to the seabed without including what is in the water of the seawater. So it doesn't refer to fisheries or it doesn't refer to sort of, let's say, offshore uh, wind power plants if a country decides to uh, build such. The exclusive economic zone is a more inclusive concept. So it includes everything that the continental shelf includes plus whatever is inside the sea uh, water itself and any, everything on the top. So. Let me highlight here, and we can have this opportunity to explain these concepts later. When we talk about continental shelf, this doesn't mean that this uh, part of the sea doesn't, re doesn't remain open to navigation. We don't talk about territorial waters or internal waters. This is open seas, but the countries, the nearby countries have some rights to develop this uh, part of the sea economically. So they can limit who is fishing there. They can have only their fish boats fish, but they cannot prevent anyone from sailing or even military exercise can happen there. So it is a sort of an open, an open sea. So thanks to this special relationship between the Turkey government and the Tripoli government uh, and the great dependency of the Tripoli government on Turkey, Turkey was able to sign this agreement that immediately raised a big alarm in the Greek government because, as you can see here, uh, this agreement assumed that all the Greek islands here 
at zero exclusive economic zone, zero continental shelf. This was something that Greece would not accept, as you can imagine. So in these circumstances, an older dispute emerged. The older dispute is a Greek Turkish Aegean dispute. As you can see, the Aegean Sea is in the north. It used to be the focal point of Greek Turkish disputes on the maritime borders since the 1970s. But right now, for the reasons that I'm trying, I have tried to highlight, this dispute has shifted towards the southeast. So what has happened in the latest, uh, in the, in this recent uh, uh, weeks has been linked to that. So let me show you here a slide that tells you a bit about the international legal uh, background of this discussion. As you can see, uh, if we start from the land, we can identify the internal waters, which is uh, waters that are normally closed bays or gulfs or ports that are completely under the state control. So it is like land. Territorial sea that can be from six to 12 nautical miles and used to be one of the most contentious points in greek turkish relations as we'll see later and then there is a contiguous zone which is a zone of hot pursuit so this is the area where the state can arrest uh, smugglers or criminal activities happening there and then we have the exclusive economic zone and the continental shelf in most cases because the mediterranean is a very narrow sea it's not like the Pacific or the atlantic so there are no 200 nautical miles anywhere, you know, because you hit another coast on the other side. So in this case, we have to follow the principle of equidistance. But there are other principles to follow too. And this is one of the basic disputes between Greece and Turkey. Greece tends to follow the principle of equidistance in all cases. Turkey claims that there are other arguments, other parameters that need to be considered as well. So. The original dispute in the 70s was reflecting this, what you see here. What you see on the right is the map of the Aegean on the basis of, uh, of territorial waters of six nautical miles, which is the current state of affairs. Turkey has extended its territorial waters to 12 nautical miles as the international law allows, but claimed that the Aegean is a special case. And Ever since the mid-1990s, the Turkish parliament has issued a statement stating that if Greece extends its territorial waters to 12 miles, this could be casus belli, a reason to start a war against Greece. The reason is what you see on the left. Because of the prevalence of Greek islands across the Aegean, the uh, extension of the Greek territorial waters against the open seas in the Aegean would be profound, as you can see. So this is an issue that has been always a dispute between Greece and Turkey. Uh, there have been long diplomatic, diplomatic attempts to address this. So there have been the so-called exploratory talks between the two sides. Uh, of course, exploratory talks can agree, can lead to an agreement but uh, it can also lead to an agreement to bring the issue to the International Court of Justice. This was the hope. So even if the two countries don't agree on their positions, they can agree to let an international court solve the dispute and they can live with the verdict of the court. So the closest we came to this was in 2004. That was the highlight of EU-Turkey relations, the Annan plan, everything was working well. So there was a commitment by Turkey and Greece to refer the issue to the International Court of Justice by the end of 2004, if they failed to agree on a solution. Had this happened, there wouldn't have been a dispute in the Eastern Mediterranean either, because the court would have drawn a line and we would know where is what and who is what. Unfortunately, the Greek government at the time failed to impose rule on Turkey in the European Council of December 2004. So they could have forced Turkey to say that you won't start accession negotiations unless you sign to send the dispute to the court. It would be very likely that Turkey at that time would have said yes, but that was the only moment that Turkey could have said yes, unfortunately. So the opportunity was missed and the problem re remained in a dormant state of affairs. Of course, now we know 
that the issue has become a very controversial one. Why? Because, and this is the last point I would like to highlight, a, a mind, a sort of a, a, a doctrine that was introduced by some Turkish generals some years ago, the so-called uh, Blue Homeland Doctrine, that is very reminiscent of a Turkish position in the 1980s that claimed that Greek islands have no continental shelf or no exclusive economic zone rights, became suddenly prominent in Turkey. This is, I think, a spillover effect of a number of significant political developments in the country. I refer to the conflict between uh, like Erdogan and the military in the previous decade uh, with the collaboration of the Gulen movement that led to the two, like the three, like this, Andrzej Ergenekon and Balios investigations that led to a purge of uh, hundreds of officers that were secularists and the sec the, including the generals and the admirals that were supporters of these views. So these were removed from the army and the navy, but following the coup attempt of 2016, many of them returned to uh, prominent positions in the Turkish army. And uh, through that new alliance with the Erdogan government, they were able to put forward these ideas under the new circumstances, of course, of Turkish foreign policy. This unilateralist uh, this ambition to play a role in the region and show that Turkey is a like a, make the most important regional power and an emerging global actor. So in light of this, this agreement with Libya was signed, which of course is a logical consequence of what you see on this map. The perception that all the Eastern Aegean islands have zero exclusive economic zone, zero continental shelf, they are practically captured within Turkish exclusive economic zone and continental shelf. And even Crete, like the, the fourth biggest island of the Eastern Mediterranean, or Cyprus, have no exclusive economic zone because of Turkey, sort of because of the Anatolia landmass. So this position, uh, of course, was reciprocated in the Greek, uh, the Greek nationalist media, but not the Greek government, uh, used to uh, present this map. Let me show you this. I think I show it here. This is the map that, uh, uh, let's say, the Greek uh, hard wing, like uh, nationalist circles, have forwarded, uh, which applies simply the principle of equidistance from any island uh, territory of Greece. So, not considering any other, uh, 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 like ignoring all other considerations. So. We can see here the area that has been the focal point of the recent conflict with a Turkish vessel or which race. This is the disputed area here, which if you follow the principle of equidistance from the Greek island of Meistik or Kastelorizo or, or Meis in Turkey and the nearby islands, this territory belongs to the Greek exclusive economic zone. But Turkey argues that this is disproportionate to the size or the position of the island, because this island captures all the zone that this enormous, like this very long Turkish coastline should have had. Of course, as you see, this is just a small footnote in the greater dispute. You can see the dispute at the sense here, right? This is a very sort of a very different picture. But in recent weeks, we have been discussing about this area. Why? Because Turkey sent a vessel here, there, to conduct explorations. And this vessel, uh, of course, these explorations are, according to international law, acts of sovereignty. So only the country that controls this exclusive economic zone has the right to do this. Of course, Greece, uh, in order not to appear giving up this zone to Turkey, sent its military vessels there to make a political statement. This led to Turkey sending its own vessels there to make a counter-political statement, and that's how the escalation happened. So for the last month or so, the Turkish vessel has been sailing around this region, and the, Turkish ve the Greek vessels were trying to obstruct its operations, and the Turkish vessels were trying to obstruct the operation of the Greek vessel. 
Of course, this situation is quite uh, dangerous. Why? Because accidents may happen. I don't think that any side was really interested in war. Of course, this situation led to the increase of nationalist fervor and feelings on all sides because of the pictures communicated and all this sort of situation. And as I said, uh, this was happening in an area where it's not clear or certain or possible to extract the natural gas resources. Uh, the energy or the economic dimension was uh, almost forgotten here. It was just about sovereignty and the sort of confrontation of sovereign claims by different countries. So in that respect, what is interesting, and I would like to conclude, so this is a map that I found, which tells you a lot how difficult and messy the situation has become. You can see in blue the Greek claim about the Greek exclusive economic zone. You can see the Turkish claim, and here is the order of the Libya-Turkey agreement, and you can see the same dispute regarding Cyprus. This is the exclusive economic zone that Cyprus claims, and this is the exclusive economic zone that Turkey thinks that belongs to Cyprus. And to make things more complicated, this is the exclusive economic zone that Turkey considers it belongs to the unrecognized Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. So sometimes Turkey tries to drill in the south of Cyprus, claiming that they got the license from the north to make things a bit more complicated. So what's interesting, and I will try to, to come to my conclusion here, sort of like as the time is passing, is that the Greek government was particularly alarmed by this recent uh, sort of signature of the, uh, of the Libya-Turkey agreement. It did something that we didn't do for decades. Greece signed exclusive economic zone agreements with two of its neighbors, one with Italy and one with Egypt. And I think this also, uh, uh, upset the Turkish government to some degree, especially the Egyptian uh, Greek agreement, because the Egyptian Greek agreement contravened the Turkey Libya agreement, as you will see later on the map. Italy and Greece had the continental shelf agreement since the 1970s, but this had sort of, um, and Italy had not agreed on an exclusive economic zone agreement because the line you see here doesn't follow exactly the principle of equidistance from the smallest Greek islands. There are some small islands here, Sofavas, and here, the, the Apondi Islands, which were considered in the drawing of the line, but not to full. So the Greek foreign minister, the Greek foreign ministry since the 70s, demanded that these islands would be fully considered, and Italians were not keen on doing this. Well, under the pressure of the Turkey-Libya agreement, Greece decided to confirm the line you see as the EEZ line between Egypt, uh, sorry, between Italy and Greece. So that happened in July. And last month, in August, Turkey, Greece and Egypt signed an, an agreement to partially delimit their exclusive economic zone. They decided that this border, this A to E line, is the, is the exclusive economic zone agreement between a line between Greece and Egypt. This is not the whole uh, border. Why? Because, as you see here, this is again the island of Castellores or Megisti. Because Greece and Egypt really don't agree on how much effect Castellores or Megisti should take, they decided to draw a line on what they agree and leave the rest of the story for later. But even the signature of this agreement clearly contravenes with the Italian, with the Turkish Libyan agreement because it is impossible for Turkey and Libya to have a border here and for Greece and Egypt to have a border here, right? So this generates international legal dispute. And this was the reason why the Greek government did that. And again, it's very interesting that Greece accepted a, a deviation from the principle of equidistance. So this line is not 50 percent, it's not in equal distance between the Egyptian and the Greek coast. It is slightly to the north. So it is not 50-50, it is 55-45. So 55 
percent of the line is on the Egyptian side, 45% is on the Greek side. So to some degree, Greece appeared ready to make compromises, which was something unprecedented until this summer. So what is this telling us? This is telling us that uh, this sort of mentality, I think, on both sides is uh, essential in order to reach an agreement. And this agreement can only happen within the framework of international law. So the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea has provided a framework that almost all countries in the world has agreed as the appropriate way to resolve these maritime disputes. Of course, as I said, Turkey has refused to sign this agreement because of the recognition of island rights in this agreement, but it would be very difficult for Turkey to say that this agreement has not become a sort of international customary law because the vast majority of states around the world have become parties to that agreement. So, in my view, how this conflict could be sort of resolved, it could be resolved through uh, bilateral talks between Greece and Turkey that could uh, set the framework for referring the dispute to the International Court of Justice in The Hague. And of course, as I said, uh, it would be necessary to, to highlight here that this court will decide on the basis of international law. International law is willing to uh, introduce uh, what we call equity. So you remember I showed this map here, right? It's likely if we look into other cases of international uh, decisions by the International Court that uh, Castellorizo may not be given full effect, but it will be given some effect on the, ter on the exclusive economic zone. So similar cases exist in the jurisprudence of the International Court. So uh, this is the only way for this dispute to be resolved. And that would be the ideal way for this to go Forward. Unfortunately, this requires a, a, a sort of an appropriate and uh, suitable political environment, which is not the case at the moment. So, at the moment, we can uh, at least hope for de escalation. So, the decision of Turkey to take or retrace the vessel that was contacting exploration out of this region was a very important first step for the departure of all military vessels from the region. And then, of course, we need to find ways to develop some dialogue between the two sides. It is important to highlight that Greek-Turkish relations have deteriorated significantly in the last month. One considered that uh, while Turkey's uh, relations with like, other neighbors were getting uh, increasingly problematic, Greek-Turkish relations were not attracting much attention. Nevertheless, in the last uh, in the last year, we have a number of very uh, problematic developments, and I we can start with this Sir Libya Turkey agreement that completely sort of opened the Pandora's box of maritime disputes. We can think about the uh, border crisis, like the refugee crisis on the Greek Turkish border in March, that also raised tension in uh, in Greek Turkish relations. And we can even consider some decisions like the conversion of Hagia Sophia and Hora Karie monasteries to mosques. Of course, these are not strictly speaking Greek Turkish issues. They are international questions, right? It refers to UNESCO, it refers to sort of Turkey's own uh, view of its own cultural heritage and how it, 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 it views its own history. But you can imagine that such decisions, such developments have harmed a lot. Uh, like uh, Greek-Turkish rapprochement supporters within the Greek public opinion. There was a sort of a very negative reaction in this development. So in that respect, of course, uh, I would also like to highlight that, uh, and that could be my concluding point. Let me come to, the, to my slides here. I highlighted how the International Court of Justice has shown flexibility, which is necessary to resolve such disputes. But I also think that uh, it is important to develop the energy uh, 
market, the energy projects in the Eastern Mediterranean in a cooperative and not an exclusive way. So including Turkey to this project and finding a way for natural gas to become a common source of prosperity for the region, I think is essential. And it's not only essential because this would support peace and cooperation in the region, it's also essential because we're running out of time. Uh, the transition of the global economy to the post, uh, to uh, like a renewable energy and the uh, declining uh, sort of interest in investment on, um, on hydrocarbons is likely to kill the projects of monetizing natural gas in the Eastern Mediterranean if we don't move fast. And in order to move fast, we, know, we need all partners on board. So uh, a new design of the East Mediterranean energy development uh, projects that would include Turkey, I think would be a very smart thing to do and possibly the only way for the monetization of this existing and future reserves that may be discovered through further exploration. So my time is up, so I will stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Yanni. So uh, the, what we're going to do is uh, uh, we ask our participants, our uh, attendees, to uh, send questions using the Q&A tab uh, on the screen. And uh, Yanni will take those questions. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, as you're composing your questions, I, I wanted to ask uh, a couple of things, if I may. Um, and one has to do first, you know, how much of this crisis is a crisis of Turkey's making? Because, mm -hmm. I mean, when you look at Turkish foreign policy, especially since the start of the, the so-called Arab Spring, mm -hmm. um, it has, you know, Turkey has placed some bets that turned out to be, you know, really misguided. And uh, right now, Turkey is at a point where you know, it doesn't even have ambassadorial uh, representation in Egypt, right? Yeah. Uh, in uh, in Israel, Israel if I'm not mistaken, and uh, in, Syria. in Syria, of course. So, I mean, Turkey has basically cornered itself, and so that so on the one hand, there is the foreign policy uh, component to this, but you know, it's interesting since 1996, the EMEA Kardak crisis. We can witness anything like this of this sort, this magnitude, and that also brings to mind the question of like how much of this is a is an internal, you know, domestic policy issue for Turkey, especially considering that uh, there was this announcement uh, about uh, gas fields under the Black Sea, you know, that were discovered, and like you pointed out, it probably uh, would cost more to take that gas. Pay for it coming from uh, Russia. So, so it, there seems to be some kind of effort on the part of uh, Erdogan to, you know, really, um, I don't know, uh, influence his uh, supporters, his base uh, in Turkey, rejuvenate them because this is also a very, you know, nationalist uh, issue, really. Um, so there's. I, I wanted to, you know, ask you if you could, you know, talk a little bit about that. And the other thing I wanted to bring up is also the really complicated international uh, context for this. I mean, you know, Cyprus has also, in a way, used this uh, crisis that there was that whole connection with, you know, the Belarus uh, resolution, the, the sanctions that were supposed to be uh, placed. And then Cyprus suddenly, you know, brought up this this issue. Uh, sort of like, you know, in 2004, the Kofi Annan plan, um, you know, that was a failure. And and since then, basically, you know, because Cyprus was admitted with no strings attached, there's not really any kind of leverage. And at that point, uh, I think the, the, the Greek, uh, you know, Cypriot uh, presentation was also, this is, also about uh, the expansion of, of Europe, you know, including the Eastern European countries. 
So, and uh, another uh, international player here that was really important was, was France and how mm -hmm. France was, you know, kind of um, really aggressive in uh, asking for, you know, uh, sanctions against uh, Turkey, you know, immediate action. Um, but then this kind of fizzled out because, you know, the, the meeting of the, you know, seven Mediterranean countries, um, it, it looks like France did not really come out of that meeting, uh, really having made much of a, a difference impact. And it now seems like the, the consensus was, OK, you know, let's try to calm these people down. And this is just posturing and, you know, avert the crisis. And now let's see what happens, because right now, I mean, uh, the world is kind of rudderless, as you know. Um, so uh, I was wondering, in addition to my first question, which is already really long, and I'm sorry, but uh, in addition to that, I was wondering if you could comment a little bit about, you know, the, the intervention or the participation of other international actors in this okay. crisis, how that, you know, came to be and how yeah. you uh, view that, especially when it comes to, you know, the um, some sort of resolution to this situation. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much for all very interesting questions. Let me start with the first. I do agree that um, uh, what we're witnessing in the Eastern Mediterranean is a reflection of Turkey's increasing isolation in the region, uh, starting with great ambitions and starting with ambition to lead the region, mainly through the Muslim Brotherhood and its different branches around in Egypt or in Syria or in Libya, Turkey has come to a position where it's really cornered and isolated, uh, with exception of Qatar and the Tripoli government in Libya, there are no strong Turkish allies in the region. So in a sense, uh, in, in my opinion, uh, there is no better explanation of this by the signature of the Greek-Egyptian agreement. Why? Because Turkey was promising Egypt a bigger exclusive economic zone had they signed the agreement with them. Of course, they would give what Greece considered its own exclusive economic zone. But had Egypt agreed with Turkey, they would have gotten a bigger chunk. But they chose to agree with Greece and be happy with a smaller chunk, which shows the level of like the negative relations between Turkey and Egypt right now. So this is telling a lot along the lines of what you said. Of course, uh, it is true that foreign policy in Turkey in recent years has become increasingly affected by domestic consideration because it is a way to rally popular support. It is a way to rally the opposition against the opposition. It is a way to argue that it's the Beka issue, the survival, like a Turkey is on survival mode. And if you're on survival mode, you don't challenge the government and the president. Especially if you develop this narrative that we are fighting against the post-imperial forces and we try to restore the dignity and the honor of the Islamic world and we have a strong Ottoman legacy. So we have a right to be in Libya while others don't. So all these are particularly important parts in a narrative that Erdogan has developed in order to appeal to his audience in the country, in Turkey. At a time when the economy is in very deep trouble, people face unemployment, people face high inflation, people face, face a sort of the collapse of the Lira exchange rate. So all this becomes to some degree a sort of smoke screen against facing the real issues that the country is having. So this is definitely a case. But as I try to explain in my presentation as well, it is also this recent alliance with some segments of the so-called Eurasianists general. So these are officers, but are not supporters of the European integration of Turkey because they've given up on Turkey's democratization. They think that Turkey can be better as an autocracy. They don't consider uh, closer relations with Europe or even the United States or NATO membership is no more a sort of essential or uh, they can even view Turkey outside NATO, which is, of course, very like it used to be very unexpected, like very marginal view. But now there are more people in Turkey that think along these lines. 
these people came to power and they brought an agenda on the maritime issues and on, on the maritime border issues. And actually, these people were also involved in the Emia Karda crisis. The, so the argument that uh, there are some disputed islands in the Aegean was a consequence of the fact that the international law gave these strong territorial water rights to all Aegean islands. So they thought that a way to protect Turkish interests is to put a sovereignty claim on all the islands that are not specifically named in treaty. So this is the case, and you know, this has traveled ever since to this case of 18 Greek islands, Turkish islands that Greece occupies. It's been a story that goes on to Turkish press, secularists mainly, but now Islamists too. It's been an interesting sort of transition of this, of this story. What you mentioned about Belarus is also very important. We shouldn't forget that European foreign policy operates on consensus still. And consensus requires package agreements. And countries that have a veto power and see that the big countries or the majority are not willing to make the steps that they are willing to do, they can try to harm or make them feel some pain by obstructing some decisions that are more important for them. So for, let's say, for Poland, what happens in uh, south of Castellorizo may not be so important, but ha what happens in Belarus is very important. So Cyprus and all countries in the EU would do that for their, what they consider their national interest. They try to trade favors or they try to trade support. But the problem here is, and that's a greater discussion that exists in the EU, should we engage Turkey with sanctions or should we engage Turkey and try to find channels of communication cooperation? That's a perennial discussion and has become even stronger because of the recent shift, this democratic backsliding of Turkey. So that discussion was different 10 years or seven years ago, but this is different today. There are still some countries like Germany that prioritize dialogue. France has emerged as a more aggressive actor in that respect. And I argue that this is due to a number of reasons. France has always been more unilateralist and more security or military oriented in the European Union. Historically, if we look into the history of European integration, France was the military wing of the European project. Germany was a stronger economy and they thought that they can complement each other. And in a sense, uh, the absence of uh, Germany's strong military gave France some leverage on developments in the European Union. So if you remember, it was France that attacked the Gaddafi regime and led to the collapse of the Gaddafi regime. It was in Germany was against this move. So to make things more complicated, France and Turkey have become increasingly uh, um, at loggerheads. They have been contra on a number. East Med is only one of the fronts. If you look what's happening in in, uh, in the Sahel, in Mali, Niger, in the in former areas of French control, post-colonial control, where Turkey is trying to push and acquire influence. I can give you an example. There was a recent coup in Mali that was held by Islamist officers and uh, against the French-supported government. And despite this strong democracy rhetoric of the Turkish government, when it comes to Egypt, for example, that Sisi is illegitimate because he's a dictator and he overthrew the government of the country. Well, in Mali, a coup happens and the Turkish foreign minister is the first visitor. And of course, France notes this, right? Because they see that Turkey is trying to get, gain influence in areas which, is, which used to be French control. So other dispute is in sort of in Syria. Of course, Syria, they are both anti-Assad, but France has a major problem of Islamist radicalization. So thousands of French citizens went to ISIS and may be fighting now in Libya under Turkish protection. So there are, num uh, there are a number of issues where Fra France and Turkey have big disputes. 
I, I add to this what appears to be a very important factor in Turkish foreign policy, personal relations within, Tur within the Turkish president and other leaders. Like personality matters. Personalities matter here. And it seems that the personal relationship between the Turkish and the French president have never been worse. We can make the opposite argument with, with the Merkel-Erdogan relationship, which appears to be better than the institutional relationship between the two countries. So in that respect, uh, what happens in the East Med and France's strong support for Greece is only a reflection of this. And let me add to that, that France has been able to acquire some very lucrative defense contracts from Greece because of the crisis. So Greece will be buying new aircraft, new frigates from France. Of course, this is not good news for those who hope that Greek Turkish rapprochement would lead to a decline of military expenditure and investment on education or sort of like social projects and so on. But unfortunately, this is the state we are right now. So to conclude my point, of course, there is a vacuum here and this is the United States missing, right? So. Trump's decision to withdraw from the region has allowed both France and Turkey to try to fill this gap. So in the Emia Carta crisis, it was the United States that stopped this uh, escalation, while here is Germany that it has been trying to do this. And that's very remarkable, I think. So, may I, 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 I need to add questions? that. Uh... Um, I, I was going to say, just go ahead and uh, you, you can see the questions, right? Mm -hmm. So you'll, you'll take your, okay, you'll take so your own questions. Of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, see the question from Hannah. Uh, unfortunately, environmental concerns is not a priority in the whole discussion about East Med exploration. And this is uh, sort of a very stupid thing to do, in my view, not only because of the fact that the environment matters, it matters a lot, but all these countries are tourist destinations. Like the biggest industry in Greece and in the south coast of Turkey is tourism. And nobody wants to see old rigs or oil like tankers traveling in and out, uh, posing a major risk for environmental disasters. Unfortunately, this has never been discussed. But as I said, uh, the feasibility of these projects is very questionable given the current state of world economy and given the transition of the world economy to the post-carbon phase. So I agree that this is a very important point. Uh, I see Denise's question. Hi, Denise. So let me see. Well, uh, it's interesting, you know, that uh, you talk about the Egypt-Turkey Egypt negotiation, the intelligence level. There has been an interesting um, bifurcation in Egyptian foreign policy towards Greece. The Sisi people, the Sisi regime, it's clearly anti-Turkey because of this personal confrontation and because of the fear of the Muslim Brotherhood. They have been closer to Greece, closer to Cyprus, closer to Israel, more willing to sign deals with Greece. But the Egyptian bureaucracy, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, has been always more pro-Turkey. I wouldn't say that they support Turkey, but they wouldn't like to take the risk of fully endorsing the Greek position. This is also very often the case with the Israeli foreign ministry that don't want the complete destruction of Israeli-Turkish relations although Netanyahu may be pushing things to that direction. So I would argue that the news you're following reflects on this, that despite the agreement between Greece and Egypt, some segments of the Egyptian state, the foreign minister or the intelligence community, try to signal Turkey that we're not giving up on trying to rebuild our relationship. But of course, the relationship cannot be rebuilt fundamentally without the two leaders agreeing. So there are certain limits of this uh, uh, reconciliation right now. So Anush now. Well, the disputes, uh, thank you for your questions. They have been portrayed in sort of you saw black and white terms, as you can imagine. So in Greek media, it is all about Turkey 
trying to grab Greek land or Greek maritime zones. There is no discussion about how the international court has been dealing with this and whether the sort of the, the Greek claims can be questioned to some degree or whether they are fully legitimate. And the same is the case in Turkey. So the, I, the maps I showed you circulate in the national media of all countries and they put this is the truth, this is the case. So they are completely sort of illegal, they are pirates. And uh, of course, in Turkey, the discourse goes further because France joins Greece. And this is the sort of discourse that Turkey is encircled by enemies, but Turkey is stronger than before, so it will never succumb to pressure coming from the imperialist powers and their local lackeys. IPEC knows this much better than anybody, how the narrative of the late Ottoman Empire was presented, right? That the poor Armenians or the poor Greeks fell victims to like imperialist plots against the Ottoman Empire. So there's a sort of simulation of this in some Turkish nationalist media. So on... Uh, well, the situation, like you're asking about the land conflicts on the other side of a Turkish border. Right now, at least officially, uh, like Turkey doesn't, uh, it, Turkey has made sovereignty claims on some small Greek islands, but the sovereignty claim is that this is undisputed. So this, this is disputed. So let's bring it to court. Of course, Greece appears very unwilling to do this because they think that, you know, we're just discussing our sovereignty. You can, we're not winning anything, but we may lose a lot. So, and of course, politically, it's impossible to do this. But when we talk about maritime zones, the issue is less, it has become politicized and it appears as if the land, so let me, uh, I remember I showed you this map with this exclusive economic zones in colors. So maps tend to identify maritime zones with land, but this is not true. So the, uh, the rights of, uh, literal states remain quite limited, especially in the exclusive economic zone. It's just the right to fish and drill for oil. That's all. But you can sail, you can move like military, like Turkish vessels can come or Greek vessels or American and Russian. So there is a misperception there in the public opinion that they consider to, that, you know, this is going to be our land. So our country is going to be as big as the Mavi Vatan map or as the Greek map about the exclusive economic zone. This is not the case. So in that respect, uh, the dispute is more technical as, as well because it is possible for the, if the issue comes to the international court, it is possible for the principle of equidistance to not apply in all cases. So there are cases of the International Court of Justice for example, there was a case between Malta and Libya, but Malta claimed the principle of equidistance and the international court said no, because Libya is so big and the Malta coast is so small, we will move it a bit to Libya's benefit. So there is some room for maneuvering there, but we have to assume that both sides subscribe to the international law and agree to send it there. The reason why the Greek government of 2004 didn't force Turkey to bring the case to the international court was because they knew that the court would uh, not likely give Greece 100% of what it expected. So, but they were not willing to, to swallow that and digest this. So just like unfortunately in our region, hitting the can down the road, so not solving the dispute and managing it for the benefit, the short-term benefit of the political leaders, becomes the rule. Of course, this means that the crisis can bring the problem out of all proportions, just like the discovery of energy in the East Mediterranean raised the issue. So, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm now reading uh, Anush's last point. Yes, of course, I, I agree that uh, the bakud bilisi Chehan pipeline was constructed in a way to isolate Armenia. So in that respect, you can argue that the East Med pipeline could be perceived as such a project. And that's why I try to highlight that this is not a sound way 
to develop the project and it's not a sub way from the business point of view because it's very expensive. Maybe the Bakut Milisi Chehan pipeline could be built through Georgia and not through Armenia. Uh, so it was a viable it was a viable project despite the high the, the higher expenses. But this East Med pipeline project is not likely to be built because it's so difficult to build 2,000 meters underwater. So. Well, uh, Mitsotakis says, uh, you say, Denis says that Mitsotakis is unusually maximalist. And what is the Greek, Greek position? Well, let me explain on this. Uh, it is a, a very interesting situation because Mitsotakis himself is considered to be quite moderate in issues of foreign policy. But he appears to be running a party that is very nationalist. So he appears to be a sort of minority within his party. So. The public opinion of his voters is normally much more anti-Turkey, much more nationalist, much more maximalist in foreign policy issues. So he, is, so he has to manage this to some degree. But as I try to highlight this, the signature of the Egyptian, the, sorry, the Libya-Turkey agreement cornered him because uh, it appeared that even Crete didn't have exclusive economic zone. Don't forget he's from Crete too, so that maybe has played a sort of a, some sort of role into this. So it's not a discussion about Castellori's or Megisti anymore. It's a much bigger issue. Like it reminds of the Mavi Vatan map. But the very point that the Greek government says that we're willing to get this issue to the court implies that the Greek government might be willing to accept a compromise because it, everybody knows that the court will come up with a compromise. This is the nature of the International Court of Justice and this is the nature of reaching such agreements. Like if you look into all the previous agreements of the court, there have been elements of compromise. And most importantly, as I try to highlight, there is compromise with Italy and Egypt to reach agreements. So in both agreements, there was no 100% principle of equidistance in the drawing of the lines. There were some cases where some small islands were considered less. This is not to say that they were not considered. They were considered, but not fully. They were like, they got 60% or 70% of their exclusive economic zone. So under these circumstances, and given the very uh, sort of uh, polemical Greek public opinion on this issue, that has been reinforced by the issues I mentioned before, the border crisis, the Hagia Sophia or the Cora sort of issue. So the government has been trying to manage through a very difficult public opinion. And the very decision to sort of the very point we are right now, I think was achieved with a lot of effort. So the, the escalation, which is happening right now is a very important success. And I assume that the future summit, EU-Turkey summit, which is happening next week, so Turkish uh, president is meeting the European Union leaders in Brussels, will try to frame developments into institutionalizing Turkish dialogue on the, on the maritime zones dispute. Maybe they will try to have a meeting between the two leaders, because as I tried to highlight from the beginning, their personal relationship has not been good for, for a number of reasons. So they, like, uh, there's a lot of work to be done on that level as well. And this would make sure that at least things don't go worse. So there is no escalation. But the, country, the two sides can agree to disagree, but they will not move into acts that are going to increase tension and bring the possibility of conflict closer than ever. And as I said, this sort of sending this vessel into this part of the Mediterranean that Turkey considers its own, Greece considers its own, was something that it would be impossible for the Greek government to ignore because had they sent no vessels there, they would be appearing as giving up Greek claims on Turkey. So removing, uh, all the vessels from there is the best way to do. Every side has its own opinion. They agree to disagree, 
and they can either stay silent and leave the issue dormant, or ideally they can agree to bring the issue to the international court, which could be the way to solve the problem. I think. These are the questions I see so far. Yeah, I uh, I think those were uh, I think you addressed all the questions if I'm counting them uh, correctly and if not you know as I'm talking somebody else can just type their question but um, yes. I wanted to, I I just wanted to add something since you brought up the, brought up the Ottoman Empire and you know you're asking for this. So I was thinking <laughs> when you were talking about, you know, the, the problems uh, between France and Turkey, and it's, it's actually kind of scary considering that Macron is also not coming out very strongly in favor of NATO. And, you know, these old alliances were things that one could rely on to, you know, calm things down when things got out of hand. And mm -hmm. I mean, when the U.S. is completely out of the picture and when you have, you know, European leaders, uh, you know, disputing among themselves the, the long term, you know, mission of these organizations, you start wondering, you know, how uh, such problems in the future will be uh, resolved. But um, going back to the Ottoman thing, I was I was just thinking, I mean, this this has a lot to do with Turkey or let's say Erdogan posing as the somehow, you know, some kind of leader. I don't want to use the word caliph, but he may even fashion himself uh, something like that. Uh, you know, leader for the for the Sunni Muslim world and, you know, using that kind of uh, capital uh, to, you know, show these countries, these Europeans, uh, their place and, you know, really thorn on the side of uh, France, like you mentioned. And it's 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 a little reminiscent of Abdul Hamid II's use of yeah. pan-Islamism, not because, you know, he had any real control over this, but, you know, it, just to, you know, um, how can I say, strategically deploy it. Although I guess the major difference is uh, there was a little more, um, I don't know, uh, established imperial uh, background to these claims, rather than the the current situation. But like you said, it's 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 clear that uh, France has a very important you know radicalization problem, and Turkey suddenly showing up, like you said, in Mali, for instance, is is just let's say rather bizarre, <laughs> for lack of a better term. Yeah, it, it is a yeah, no, go ahead. So, there, there are very number of very interesting developments. And as you try to highlight, we talk about there is this uh, co concept that is used in a very, uh, let's say, inaccurate way, this neo ottomanism you know. And, you know, Prince Bahadin is confused with <laughs> what we are witnessing right now. But I think it is at Hemel Dem who introduced, uh, I, I, I listened to his a talk of his, uh, talks about Hamidism. This is what we're going through. It's like Abdul Hamid II, sort of <laughs> the replay of the late years of the Ottoman Empire in the context that just like, like Najib Fasil Kisakurek and this sort of people where we reviewed late Ottoman history as a struggle of Abdul Hamid against everybody inside and outside Turkey, like a brave struggle that was finally lost. It was mainly lost to the young Turks and the Kemalists, not to the foreigner. So we may be witnessing a similar development in this case. And uh, of course, the role of France and foreign forces and the role of countries like Greece or so Armenia in that respect, finds, uh, they find themselves into this uh, discussion. So I remember, for example, like Pulusia Kar was making a couple of statements a few days ago, saying to the Greek side, don't fall into France's trap because you will be sacrificed. So you, so you are the sort of the sort of the tool of France against Turkey. Don't play that role because this is going to be very costly and very dangerous for you. But um, at the same time, I think it is important to highlight that uh, 
this is a project that has been going on for some time. So you see the TV series, there are a number of sort of publications that reproduce this, this uh, sort of uh, view of uh, uh, AKP and Turkish government as trying to uh, prove Turkey's honest, uh, sort of Turkey's role as a regional and global leader. And uh, regardless of the sort of uh, the fundamentals of these claims that uh, are becoming weaker and weaker. And Turkey, as we said before, has been quite isolated on a number of levels. But on the other hand, as you said, uh, the fact that NATO is in this trouble and the fact that uh, even the United States under President Trump considered leaving NATO, as we now know, <laughs> like we, it sets the world in a completely new a framework. And in these circumstances, we may be uh, able to uh, witness developments and see uh, incidents that would be unthinkable before. So, for example, let me give you another example. Many thought that Turkey's invasion of Syria would uh, attract a lot of international uh, protests or sort of, uh, kind of con condemnation. It didn't happen. So, Turkey's presence in Libya the same. So, in a sense, the international community has become weakened because of the United States' uh, unwillingness to play that role and because of the United States' decision to withdraw into its main foreign policy uh, objectives. And, of course, uh, I think that uh, the upcoming American elections will also be important on this issue, among many other issues, of course. Uh, so, and uh, let me give you an example. President Biden, like candidate, the, the presidential candidate Biden, uh, as vice president, was very interested in Cyprus. So he had visited the island. He had developed a close uh, sort of attention on the issue. So I wouldn't be surprised if he has a personal interest in case he is elected in resolving the Cyprus dispute, exactly because, as I tried to highlight in my presentation, the current East Med crisis is also, to some degree, a spillover of the Cyprus crisis. Turkey bought these vessels, this Oruç Reis and Yavuz and Fatih, because of Cyprus. Turkey didn't have these vessels before. It had to hire these vessels, and hiring these vessels was complicated. Right now, it has the vessels there, it can send them anywhere at any time and cause sort of conflict and sort of confrontation with Greece and other neighbors. So resolving the Cyprus issue would be uh, a very, very important step forward. And uh, of course, there are right now elections in the, in the north of the island, which are affected by COVID, as you can imagine. So the election of a, pres of a president of a leader with pro solution is likely to maintain this uh, optimism that uh, can be reinforced by the election of, Pres of Biden into this. If President Trump gets elected, I think we may be witnessing more of what we've been witnessing so far. So even less American involvement in the region and uh, sort of uh, a further deterioration of the global uh, order and uh, this leading to more unilateral initiatives by countries like Turkey or France and uh, higher possibilities for conflict, unfortunately. Well, thank you so much. And it's, it's always a great pleasure to see you. I'm, uh, I wish it was under different circumstances, but uh, anyhow. about this issue and uh, like I said let's hope that next time it will be different and next time maybe uh, you know these multilateral treaties you know let the and you know uh, national international organizations will be uh, functioning slightly more uh, in the in the spirit in which they were you know organized established in the in the first place but uh for the time being we'll just uh we're just good with de-escalation and you know yeah. as you said kicking the can down the road <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> that's that's better than uh, a real, you know, uh, engagement or um, you know, war even. So thanks a lot, and um, I, I'm also thanking our audience for joining us, and uh, I hope to see you uh, virtually in our uh, upcoming events. And um, thanks again, Miani, and have a good evening. Thank you very much Ipek, for the invitation and thank you to the audience for their questions. So I look forward to seeing you physically this time soon. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye.